So the advantages, as with all of the technologies that we're going to talk about, are that it's much more cost effective and much faster. Um, it allows you to sequence multiple genes, as I mentioned, in a single experiment, and you can reliably detect point mutations. So this is a great technology for missense or nonsense mutations that occur at a single base pair change. Um, some of the disadvantages of this technology is that you don't get good data from regions of the genome that are GC rich. So there are particular genes that, you know, when we're evaluating this technology from a lab standpoint, we might look at it and say, well, it seems like it might be a good candidate, but when you actually look at the sequence of the DNA, it's too GC rich and we're not going to get quality data from using this technology. Um, GC-rich regions of the gene or other areas where you get gaps in the data, so your hybridization just doesn't look good, um, may require follow-up with capillary sequencing. So if you're using a full-service lab who has the ability to do this technology and also capillary sequencing, they may be using actually both technologies to give you a result on your patient. Um, that's actually beneficial to you. Um, if you're using a laboratory that's only got the ability to do the resequencing sequencing array, what they may be reporting out to you is whatever data that they get. Um, and if they don't generate good quality data, there may be exons or particular areas in the gene where you're not getting a result for that particular region. Um, this technology, as I mentioned, is great for detecting point mutations. It can only identify frame shift mutations, so small insertions or deletions that are included in the array design. So there are many, many genetic disorders where this technology is just not the most appropriate one to be using. Um, it's really ideal for disorders like Noonan, Costello, CFC, and Leopard syndromes, um, and also for hereditary periodic fever syndromes would be another example. So familial Mediterranean fever and related disorders that are caused primarily, you can think of these as disorders due to activating mutations um, or gain of function mutations in most cases. Um, this technology could be used as an initial screen for other disorders where you do see frame shift mutations, but you just want to be aware if you're using it for other disorders that it's sort of an initial screen. And if your patient's result is negative, they may still need follow up with a different sequencing technology that can identify previously unreported frame shift mutations. Um, as with all of these technologies, this isn't necessarily a disadvantage, but just something to keep in mind. Any abnormal results should be confirmed, preferably by a different technology. Um, so usually that would be, you know, sequencing the exon with the mutation by capillary sequencing or doing a restriction digest or something like that to confirm. So coming back to your clinic patient for the day. If you remember, the first patient was uh, suspected to have Noonan syndrome or a related disorder. And so the patient had mild to moderate MR, short stature, pulmonic stenosis, ptosis, low set ears, and sparse curly scalp hair. So for those of you who are familiar with this group of disorders, you may think, oh, CFC seems more likely because of the degree of mental retardation and the sparse curly scalp hair. But those features can certainly happen in Noonan syndrome as well. Um, so if you're thinking about CFC syndrome, um, mutations are identified in a little over 60% of patients with this clinical diagnosis, and the mutations can occur in any one of four genes. Um, mutations are identified in about 65 to 78% of patients with Noonan syndrome. And again, there are four different genes that have been associated with Noonan syndrome. And you'll notice that there actually is some overlap. So mutations in the KRAS gene can cause either a CFC presentation or a Noonan syndrome presentation. So in your particular clinic patient, um, you could have traditionally, you know, ordered sequencing, but instead you can now do a resequencing array that evaluates for mutations in the eight genes in the RASMAP K pathway. Um, so this will identify mutations in the seven genes I mentioned associated with CFC or Noonan syndrome, and also the HRAS gene associated with Costello syndrome. Um, so you order the resequencing array on your patient, and lo and behold, you identify a mutation in the PTPN11 gene, so that confirms a diagnosis of Noonan syndrome. 
Um, now, because you were more clinically suspicious of CFC syndrome, this is just to give you an example of how the resequencing array can be often much more cost effective um, and also much faster. Traditional didioxy sequencing, starting with the CFC genes first and then moving to the Noonan genes in a sequential manner, um, would have likely cost you over $4,000 um, and taken typically at least 15 weeks if done sequentially. With the resequencing array, the cost is about $1,500, and you could have results in about five weeks. So you're significantly reducing your turnaround time um, and also the cost to the patient. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about pyrosequencing. Um, Pyrosequencing is a technology that has been around for a, a while in a research setting, but is just starting to become more clinically available. And again, just sort of a brief overview. Um, your patient's DNA acts as the template, and you put that into a reaction with all of these enzymes. Um, and the complementary nucleotide is added. When that happens, that sets off a reaction that generates light. And that light is read by a laser, which is able to determine which particular base was added to your patient, to the template DNA. So this is an example of what the results would look like. This is what's called a pyrogram. Um, the height of each peak is based on the intensity of the light signal. So if you have one G nucleotide, you would see a peak that's approximately this high. If you have two of the same nucleotide in a row, so a G and a G side by side, um, you would see a peak that looks like this, and you can see that that peak height is approximately twice as high as the height of the peak here. Um, so in the example to the right, this particular patient's DNA sequence would be G, C, A, G, G, C, C, T. So pyrosequencing, again, is cost effective. Um, it's very fast. So this is a technology that often is used not necessarily for sequencing entire genes, um, but usually to screen for multiple common mutations associated with a genetic disorder. But again, the advantage is that it can be done in a single assay. Um, you can screen for several mutations within a period of about 30 minutes from the time you start getting everything set up until the time that it's done. Um, it's highly sensitive technology, it's relatively easy to use, and really the main advantage of pyrosequencing is that it's quantitative. So this is a great technology for the detection of common mitochondrial DNA mutations because it gives you some idea about the percentage of heteroplasmy, which you can't get doing other technologies like sequencing or restriction digest. Um, you also can quantify the degree of DNA methylation in epigenetic disorders, so this is another advantage of having this ability to actually quantify um, using this technology. As with the resequencing arrays, this is really not ideal for identifying previously uncharacterized or unknown insertions or deletions. Um, also, as you can imagine, if the peak height is proportional to the number of nucleotides in a row, if you have just two, it's clearly easy to see that that peak height is double the size you'd expect it to be if there was a single G there. But if you have more than five or six of a single nucleotide in a row, it gets really difficult to interpret the data. So again, the lab really needs to look at what you're trying to sequence and determine if this is the ideal technology or not. Um, and as with all of these, um, any abnormal results should be confirmed using a different methodology. So you really want a full service lab that has the ability to do not just pyro sequencing, but other things. So coming back to your second patient of the day, um, with a clinical and biochemical diagnosis of Lee syndrome, um, a muscle biopsy has been done and it suggests a complex one deficiency. Um, so you've narrowed it down to many different genetic testing options. Um, so about 10 to 20 percent of patients with this clinical diagnosis have a mutation at the 8993 position in the mitochondrial DNA um, MTATP6 gene. Um, about 10 to 20 percent have mutations in other mitochondrial genes. Um, so that leaves uh, anywhere from 20, or I'm sorry, 60 to 80 percent of patients 
uh, with mutations in nuclear genes. There have been more than 10 that have been identified. Um, five of them are specifically known to cause complex one deficiency. So when you're seeing this patient in clinic, you're going to hope that they have one of the common mitochondrial DNA mutations, but you can see that there obviously are potentially a lot of different genetic tests that you may need to do.